We're now being joined by Madhavan Nair, the former chairman of ISRO. Sir, thanks so much for joining us. Now, one of the major things that's got a lot of people's interest and attention is the cost. How has India been able to do this at such a low cost? And by the way, has that always been the ambition since the time when you were the chairman of ISRO to do things at a very frugal way? Uh, well, certainly the Indian uh, space program is uh, very cost effective. Uh, there are several reasons for it. One is the long-term vision and the goals, what ISRO sets, and uh, work in a systematic manner to achieve those goals. And benefits of whatever we have learned earlier will be uh, utilized for the further advancement of the space program as well. Uh, starting from the 60s onwards, we start uh, the development of the rockets, the satellites, and the application technology has progressed very well. And uh, whatever we have learned in the lessons in that has been reused in various uh, ways. Second, of course, is the uh, homegrown technology. It is entirely within the ISRO laboratories. All these technological challenges are met. And the cost effectiveness of carrying out research in a government setup is unique. Right. So of the major plans that are now being spoken about, whether it's going to Venus or Aditya mission or whether it's a Gaganyan, which do you think is the most important and also the most challenging? Well, all these uh, programs are uh, important and uh, really equally challenging, especially the Gaganyan program, where we are having an ambitious goal of developing a capsule which can carry three astronauts to the lower orbit, uh, sustain them for about a week or two, and bring them back safely is going to be the most uh, challenging uh, assignment for ISO in the near future. And let's now get some more perspective on that from Professor Arup Das Gupta, former Deputy Director of ISRO. Professor Das Gupta, great talking to you because now the euphoria is going to give way to the actual science. And I wanted to really spend some time with you to understand the science that is now going to be done. What are going to be the key highlights of this mission in the days ahead? Well, uh, as you know that uh, actually there are the three elements uh, of the whole Chandrayaan-3. Uh, the first, of course, is the uh, what we call as the propulsion module, which incidentally also, also has a sensor. Then we have the uh, Vikram lander, which has, uh, I think, three major sensors. And then we have the Pragyan rover, which has two major sensors. So why the moon is interesting to us now is that there are possibilities of starting a moon base, a moon base from where we can then jump on to other planetary explorations. If you want to set up a moon base, then what do you need? So all the efforts that uh, 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 the Chandrayaan-3 is going to put in is essentially trying to find out what are the things that are there. So I guess the most important part of the next 14 days is really going to be the search for, for water because what you were saying about a moon base, if we are to ever set up a moon base, then water will be really essential and required for that. So a big, big headline from this would be if the rover can actually find water on the surface of the moon. Absolutely correct. Water is going to be the key discovery. Uh, second discoveries are going to be minerals, minerals which can be used for fabrication and for uh, creation of items. For example, titanium is one of the things we're looking at, because titanium is very much uh, required if you're looking at, um, you know, uh, setting up uh, a kind of moon base and things like that. So these are the two things. Plus, we are also looking at the environment of the moon. For example, there, there are most probably moon quakes. So if they are there, what is their uh, uh, strength? What is their structure? How do they originate? This is something we want to look at. I guess from an Indian point of view, uh, there will be this entire question of whether living on the moon or having a moon base is at all feasible. I know the Americans are planning another manned mission to the moon very soon. And at the end of the day, they are the only people who have been able to actually get a human being to the moon. India still has to figure out how to get an astronaut into space, and that's what Gaganyaan is going to be about in the next uh, couple of years. So the question of a moon base for us right now, is that something further in the future and for the moment, perhaps something that we would be working with the Americans and others with because we have signed the Artemis Accords? 
I think it's going to be a cooperative effort, and that's why I think they have signed the Artemis Agreement. Mm -hmm. The Artemis Agreement, uh, it, it allows us to work within the within the parameters of the UN resolutions, but at the same time, it also gives us a certain leeway in terms of commercial uh, activities. For example, let me say that with the Chandrayaan three now there. We can actually define, as per the Artemis report, we can define a safety zone where nobody else should come and disturb us. It's more or less like a stakeout. And I, I also need to look at you know what we have done, for example, in Antarctica. The situation in Antarctica today is, is what the situation on the moon is going to be maybe a decade from now. That's a really interesting point you're making, Professor Rasgupta. And one of the reasons why the success of Chandrayaan-3 has been so important, it needs to be underlined. You're saying that there is, uh, for all intents and purposes, an Indian flag on the moon. That means that India has now got certain rights as per the Artemis Accords on the moon. And therefore, in all probability, the actual effort to, may, uh, to make a base may be led by somebody else, but India has got some rights. Are you saying that we should therefore now work with the Americans uh, on that? Most probably uh, uh, with the Americans because we have signed an accord, but then the Chinese are also going to set up their own efforts. Russians, I don't know, but they may also try. And I think we keep our options open. But I think it's rather unlikely that India would actually be partnering with China right now. Russia could be possible. Russia was intended to be a partner for India. But the Russian space program seems to have fallen off a little bit in, in recent years. Yeah, the Russian uh, space program has really uh, taken a beating. And, and the uh, loss of Lunar 25 exactly shows that. Uh, but well, partnering with China, well, stranger things have happened. Right, I, mean, I, I would be surprised if it was with China, but who knows, as you, as you rightly said. Now, sir, as somebody who's been Deputy Director of ISRO, it's obviously been quite a journey from the Vikram Sarabhai days and those pictures we still see everywhere of rocket cones being you know, wheeled around on cycles. What do you think is the secret of ISRO's success? Is it, in particular, the ability to do things at a really low cost? And that's one of the things that everyone has been marvelling about, how low the costs are of the Indian space missions? Yeah, I think, you know, it really starts with uh, Professor Sarabhai. You know, the kind of excitement that he brought, even in those early days, 1969, 1970, the kind of excitement that he brought, bringing together a lot of people, you know, with the, uh, and virtually the kind of people, I mean, the people who joined. If you read some of their books, uh, I mean, they took a big risk. The whole thing could have fallen flat. But it was Vikram Sarabhai who really got it going. And although he died an untimely death, and in fact he died when we were really starting to grow, Professor Dhawan was a fantastic person. I mean, he really built ISRO into what it is today, putting together different divisions into different centers, focusing the centers on specific activities. That, that, that really set the path. As far as the frugal part of it is concerned, we, we Indians are generally very frugal. And our approach towards any design of that sort is frugality is definitely one. The other is self-reliance. Uh, sir, do you think a critical base has now been set up when it comes to technology in both space and defence? I mean, country in defence, for example, has countries like HAL, which are both in defence and in space. And that critical mass is sometimes required uh, for India to become a major tech power in its own right and then self-reliance in every sense of the word both in space and perhaps in defence as well. Has that base been set up by now? Yes, why not? Because actually, if you really look at it, if you look at the whole Chandrayaan effort, you know, the number of private industries which have contributed to it is enormous. I mean, starting from the big ones like l and and uh, Midhani and so forth, and going down to even small MSMEs, very significant uh, uh, you know, support has been given. So we now have built the base. And in fact, now we can really look at commercializing many of the things that we have developed. And we are doing that. Right, sir. Well, one last question. Looking ahead a little bit now, obviously, we're going to be looking at what Pragyan Rover finds on the moon in the next 14 days. There could be some very big headlines coming out of there, especially in case water is actually found. Other than that, the Aditya mission is there. But Gaganyaan, is Gaganyaan going to be the thing that you have your 
the I really on getting an Indian on an Indian spacecraft into space? Would that be the next big one? Obviously, in terms of the headlines, that will be a big uh, one. But it's going to take time. Because uh, once you involve human beings, you have to be not only careful, but you have to be super careful. You know, you I mean, typical engineering thing is that once a human is involved, all safety factors are 1.5 times whatever you calculate. So this is going to take uh, time. But I see a lot of small, small, small steps which are really, uh, which are maybe not going to create that kind of headline, but which are really important. Aditya L1 for science is a fantastic step forward. Uh, Nisar, which is basically again a, a joint ISRO uh, uh, NASA effort, is also going to be very, very important. Uh, then we are having a launch of our own uh, weather satellite. I think inside 3D, um, inside, um, I forget the name. Anyway, it's, it's going to be there. So these are also, you know, there are things which are happening, uh, which are really very important for our total effort. Gaganyan, yes, it, 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 ultimately we have to uh, get that technology in our hand, but then it's, it's tough to get that technology. And apparently for the Gaganyan project, we're first going to be putting some sort of a robo into space to see what happens and then eventually moving up to humans, which I guess is the, is the right way to do it. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. In fact, the next test is actually an abort test. That is, suppose everything has gone wrong. How do you save the uh, man capsule and take it away from the rocket? Right, Professor Das Gupta. Former Deputy Director of ISRO. Exciting times at abort mission, Robo, and then humans in space. These are exciting times for ISRO and for India. Thank you so much for being with us. Right, so the success of Chandrayaan 3 obviously dominated the international headlines this week. But now let's move to our regular segment of tracking what the global media is saying about India. Here are some of the other top stories from across the world related uh, to India. The Financial Times has praised the new UPI feature that allows users to use AI language tools to make payments in a more safe and secure manner. It says that about 350 users already there for UPI in their seven years. It calls UPI one of the most successful payment systems in the world. And it says that to expand its reach and bridge the urban rural digital divide is really crucial. And it says that the new feature could prove to be a game changer in that. So UPI getting some more good press. Meanwhile, uh, the BBC quoting a recent study in the Nature Journal says the Himalayas are now getting more rain where they used to earlier be mostly snow. And this change is making the mountains more dangerous because higher temperatures are causing both rain and the faster melting of snow and ice. This report is significant actually because torrential rains and ongoing construction are clearly causing significant damage and loss of life, especially in states like Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand in this monsoon season. India's moon mission signs an uncomfortable light on Russia's failure. So there was that interesting opinion piece in CNN, which shard praise, of course, on the remarkable progress of India's space program. However, it also pointed to the contrast with Russia, which, of course, faced another setback following the failure of its comeback space mission, Luna 25. According to CNN, Russia was in the urgent need for a successful lunar mission to demonstrate its continued greatness despite the setbacks it's facing in Ukraine. But Russia's failure uh, only underlines the fact that a nation that was once the front-runner in space programs is now giving way a little bit to the prowess of other countries in the space sector, most notably India. So that rather interesting opinion piece in CNN.